Welcome to the Intercut Podcast Channel, the weekly place to hear the latest on movies, TV, and entertainment that people can't cut away from. I'm your co-host, Zachary Shevichin, joining me slurping up some bathwater. It's Arturo Zarita. Got a nice glass over there? No, this is pure. This is clean, (laughs) non elorted water. I mean, you're missing out on that's, that's some tasty stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's too expensive. <laughs> Around you know, the trade. Yeah. <laughs> They've been sold out through Black Friday. I, I hear people make a killing selling their bath water. Maybe that's some like uh, missed merch opportunity for, for A24 and Salt. Is Salt for an A24? Right. Yeah. It feels like an 824S movie, so. <laughs> <laughs> I actually know it's Prime because it's an MGM movie. It's one of right, those where they, right. uh, they won't say that it's Amazon, but they'll be like, it's prestige level. It's, exactly. it's MGM, so. Uh, well, promising young woman filmmaker Emerald Fennell has returned with Saltburn. It is a psychological thriller about a university student who becomes infatuated with his wealthy classmate and begins to infiltrate his aristocratic family. It stars Barry Keegan as Oliver and Jacob Elordi as Felix, a.k.a. the subject of infatuation, as well as Rosamund Pike, Richard E. Grand, Allison Oliver, Archie Mandekwe, and Carrie Mulligan. Saltburn is a twisted tale of obsession and desire, but Arturo, is this a movie worth obsessing about? You know, I think you and I both came out of this movie never bored. I think that's mm-hmm. the thing to say right off the bat, right? Were you ever bored watching this movie? No, it is it is a uh, compelling piece of work at the very right? least. Yeah. And that's one thing that as people who watch movies over and over, you know, a dozen a week, I, I, I'll give it its props there. You and I also enjoy Promising Young Woman for the thriller that it is and I even think the commentary. We are, I think we are generally on the positive side of the reception yeah. to that movie that has a lot of detractors against it. Yeah. And we're men, so that's also going to be another detractor <laughs> coming to it as well. True. But we, like, we understand like what she was kind of going for as biting as it was. And really, I, I understand why people dislike that one because of how depressing it is. Mm-hmm. Here, it's trying to be twisted to a degree where it almost feels like it's trying too hard. A movie where it has this outsider trying to fit in, but I feel like the movie's trying to fit into this realm of cruel intentions of these erotic thrillers that people grew up with, she grew up with in the 90s to the 2000s. And for people who haven't seen those movies from the early 2000s, I think they're going to see this and go like, whoa, movies could be made like this. Whoa, movies can be this weird and, and creepy and whatever else. And I think some people may even, you know, as David Fincher says, get into that uh, sicko mode. The, the, the what did he say? The creeper, the, the perverted side yeah. of people's lives. And I think that's what she's going for. Um, but I think she tried too hard to uh, put a lot of imagery on screen that while it gets an, a, an emotion and invokes something from the audience. Mm-hmm. The more I thought about this character, and I know we'll get into spoilers later. I don't really see it being something that was beneficial to him many times for what he was going for. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a movie that's like so desperate to feel edgy that it ends up kind of making even its vulgarity a little bit boring. It's like, a see all the places we'll, we'll go that you shouldn't go. And it's just kind of like, to, to what purpose, to what end when this character sort of feels so devoid of like an internal like consistency or like a a, a logic to him? Like, I don't really well, know. Barry. Yeah, I mean, like it's it's Barry. So he pulls off like creepy weirdo, although I think he's done it significantly better in other places. Better in other things. Yeah. Uh, but it's just sort of like, is this a movie about like you know, middle-class obsession with wealth, or is it a movie about, you know, d- capital uh, uh, capital pursuits destroying people? I kind of think it's not about any of those things. It's just sort of a movie that has a fun backdrop of, like, high-class society yeah. and the snobbery that comes with it, and then puts this, like, sort of sociopathic person at its center. Uh, and, you know, it may... Maybe every generation deserves their own talented Mr. Ripley, and this is one for the Zoomers, but I just feel like it's one that is devoid of a lot of the like internal conflictedness that made some of those other stories more interesting. Yeah, I, I need to go back and rewatch Sounds of Mr. Ripley, because I-, I-, I thought that that was the movie where he, he uh, gets hit by the cars. <laughs> Did meet Joe Black? That is, not, that is not the one where he gets hit by the cars. Yeah. So I'm going to have to revisit it. Because when you told me that one, I was just like, I don't remember anyone getting hit with a car in this movie. Yeah. But I've seen that be like the reference, that and Cruel Intentions be the main two references that mm-hmm. they go for. I've also right. seen a lot of people compare it to this uh, 
Pier Paolo Pasolini film Teorema, which to, to be honest, I haven't seen that one, okay. but it's a similar Could film about this like newcomer who sort of invades the life of like this rich group of people and take takes it over in a way. And it, it's a it's a familiar it's structure. Yeah. yeah. But like I think you know, at least for me, I went back and I watched the talented Mr. Ripley because uh, Caitlin also hadn't uh, seen it. So, uh, what'd you think? Uh, I mean, liked it a lot. It's it's so fascinating, and I think it just has a lot. It, there's so much more in it about this like desire to to be the things that you're not. Uh, that feels a lot more well executed and and more fully realized in that one. And also, like the interesting thing is both that film and this one play with this idea of fluid sexuality. And I I don't know Uh if you like have an idea of whether or not uh, Barry Keegan's character here is like, gay, straight, bi, or just a sociopath. But it, 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 I think he plays, I think talented Mr. Ripley plays with that question a lot more interestingly. And I don't know if there like is an answer yeah. really at Saltburn. I think he's just whatever the movie needs him to be to get a reaction. I got one. I know what he is. He's a vampire, Zach. But I'll get into that in a little bit. <laughs> to go back on what you said, it really is a movie that, if compared to talented Mr. Ripley, in that fish out of water mentality, that that perspective... It gets mopped because that would be the most intriguing thing. I don't have a bad thing to say about from that. That's when the movie excels when he's mm-hmm. dealing, you know, with the cousin who is also uh, half fitting in because technically he's from America. Yeah, Obviously, Archie Mendeque's character. It, it, a really good role. Yeah. In his character, because he's obviously darker than the rest of the family, because of I it was the aunt or the brother, whatever the relative was that went overseas and ended up having him, and now that's why he's living there. Um, that they try to add that social commentary that you're saying, where you had mentioned it could be this, it could be that. It doesn't end up being either. The more, the most annoying part about it is that I do think it's trying to be those. It's mm-hmm. trying to say something, and in like a lot of movies today, it gets close and then realizes it either doesn't really have anything to say or is actually kind of saying a really bad thing. So then it just skirts away. Right. But if you do bring up, hey, I think it's commenting on this, oh, they'll take the credit. But then refuse to take any criticism for it and... That's the part that annoyed me the, about the movie the most. Because especially with Archie's character, you can't say that he's not bringing up so many things about him not being, him not fitting in and whatever else. And I don't know if he was originally always going to be played by someone like Archie in the in the mm-hmm. in the script. But to give him all the lines, like nobody else says those things. Some of them yeah. display it in looks, but they're like, uh, how do we uh, not make this so, so bougie? Uh, let's give it to Archie. Like right. you're saying, the, the gay connotations and even race connotations, with it being in the 2000s, you're looking at it from a 2023 lens, trying to get praise, but then also, again, not any backlash either. And I don't yeah. know, I wish it had more bite there. And I felt like it was excusing what we know. And I, look, I, I don't feel like belittling her for that because um, I think we pick and choose with directors. But I know the joke has been, uh, did they film it in her house? Because right. she obviously came from a very wealthy family. I Emily believe Fennell, she also yeah. went to Oxford. I, I've heard them you know, bring up in interviews, uh, is this like your Oxford? And she'll like be like, my Oxford. No. <laughs> Okay, yes. <laughs> She'll proceed to name all the little instances of her pretty much reenacting what was her year of uh, graduation or when she went to that school. Yeah, um, which, by the way, so the film is set in 2006, which is, like, cool. I, I love the mid-2000s it's also. It's seven. But if you if you want to include MGMT's Time to Pretend, if you want to include, include Cold War kids uh, hang me up to dry, if you want to have them sit around and watch Superbad at home, not the theatrical version, Sitting yeah. home and watching super bad. You can't set your movie in 2006. Look, I hear all that, but I took it as it was in 07 summer. I, well, he's class of 06, so wouldn't he be graduating 06? That's what I thought too, but I think he enters in even the class then, of 06. Even then, super bad was out in theaters summer of 07. Yeah. Still doesn't make sense. Uh, I saw the interview with her. Just where said she in 2008. Had said, yeah, that the music was set to. Uh, uh, 07 that summer. So I know the MGMT, the Cold War Kids one, because I know when that song came out, I was like, oh yeah, you definitely want that needle drop. Um, so I do think she's cleared on those, Zach. Do you know her excuse for the Superbad bit? I, d- I haven't heard this. And she's like, it takes place 07 in the summer. They are rich. So she has friends in the Academy who sent her a screener. <laughs> Which at <laughs> first is such a cop out. But then would be the most emerald fennel. <laughs> Actually, I did used to get screeners right. when I was young. And right. how else do you think I made it all the way to getting an Academy Award? <laughs> Honestly, yes, it's an excuse. 
Sure. But it actually makes it worse for the entire career of like, so that's how you run, that's how you won that's your Academy Award then. how you think about things. Yeah, I'm not sure that the Academy's screener game was on that level. Super bad. Where super, people were getting super bad in uh, summer of 07, but regardless, that, that's just a small that little detail. I just don't think it was for super bad. <laughs> yeah, right? For super bad, exactly. I'm sure uh, they but there, there's a lot what? of. It, you were sort of talking, though, there's a lot of stuff that's sort of just sort of stated in a very plainly obvious way. Like, they, yeah. they, they really, like, don't leave uh, a lot of the commentary on race or on class to be, like, subtext. It's it's all text and it's all kind of surface level. And I, I love how that you mentioned, like, it almost feels like the movie is, like, tiptoeing up to making a point and then backs away from it. Because some of the points that it feels like it's trying to make are, like, not things that I think Emerald <laughs> Fennel want, want to say. Like, this That's movie what I'm almost, saying, bro. It, it movie almost makes a, a case that, like, poor people are inherently less civilized yes. than the rich, which is, like, yes. <laughs> is that what you are trying to do? with your like yeah. homoerotic uh, obsession drama <laughs> it's like she's approaching it from like yeah we know the we know that the the really rich people are always doing bad things but like yeah. jokers can come from the middle class also and it's like what <laughs> i don't understand what you're saying and if you're not saying that at the end of it other than archie jacob Elordi comes a little scot free in my opinion he really comes off more like the victim the person who's really being used from the moment that he gets met in the college all the way through uh, through Saltburn, and that's where I'll, I'll give the movie its praises on the way that it looks. I know a lot mm -hmm. of people have been wondering if the, you know, that Academy ratio of yeah. it being very boxy and tall is done just because if she wants to be artsy. Um, there are a lot of shots where I think you could have, you know, captured it in a more wide setting, especially with the scope of the place. But because Saltburn is so tall, I know she really wanted to capture its height. Jacob yeah. Elordi. Archie, like these are some tall dudes. And I think the idea was to really show not just how boxed this guy is in, but the fact that everyone towers over him and to be mm -hmm. able to have that ratio, I do think it lent to some really beautiful shots. You even have some shots in the maze for the exteriors where because of how tall those hedges are, you're able to get, you know, like the scope of how big this place is. I like yeah. it. And a quick I know they're not out. playing this on IMAX screens, but it would look yeah. beautiful on that. A uh, quick shout out to the cinematographer is Linus Sandgren, who previously made La La Land and Babylon with Damien Chazelle. Uh, it's Babylon. also got yeah, really immac it's also got really immaculate production design by Susie Davis, who was previously nominated for an Oscar for her work on uh, Mr. Turner. The costume design from Sophie Canal was uh, really great. She was nominated for an Emmy on her on Bridgerton. So th there's definitely a lot of talented like craftspeople involved in this movie. I yeah. I don't have many complaints about the look of the film. I do think it was maybe a little bit dark in some places, but like half of Hollywood movies are a bit too dark in some places. And I saw it in a dark theater as well, so I, yeah. I know it wasn't like the brightest, but. I thought, I thought the glamour side of it, right, of how this kid got swept up makes complete sense. Yeah, you can understand how he, you get, yeah. like, uh, hypnotized by that world. But I also felt that he was very infatuated by the people. And mm -hmm. it's with the actors that are in this movie that I think you get, like, a, a split of several different types of characters. Uh, I think the parents were the funniest part of the movie. I feel like they're the only two who really knew what the tone of the movie was to the point that uh, Richard E. Grant is great, but... Uh, Rosman uh, Gone Pike. Girl, uh, Rosman yeah. Pike killed it. To me, I think at a certain point, she knew how much of this was not Emerald Fennel, but like kind of Emerald Fennel's yeah. uh, upbringing. And I think she took a lot of her and puts it in the movie. I feel like Rosman's one of those those actors who, if she recognizes that the, uh, that the, that the script is really close to the director's heart, will start mimicking the director and the director may not even know it. But, but the director will be like, yes, that's perfect. Go for that. She has some of the best lines in this. Uh, yeah. She has the best jokes she carries the best tone yeah she she's able to get at the sort of like callous indifference of the rich to the, the the well-being of the those around them right like she's just the sort of too? floating in her own yeah she's floating in her own world and doing her own agenda and when things sort of like work out in a way that benefits her she can bring them in but otherwise she casts them out as they're they're yeah. boring or not worth her effort and, Again, and she's I so, like, so like, cutting and, and darkly funny in the role. Yeah. Uh, she's I like for Archie's me the best. character. She I was thought, the best one. Yeah. They gave Archie a lot to work with. I think he has some yeah. of the best disses. There's a karaoke bit. I mm -hmm. was like, that's what I'm talking about. Do moments yeah. like this where you, like, all, all of their bits are always, like, cutting. You think someone's about to do someone a favor or pay them a compliment, and there's always something backhanded with it. Yeah. Yeah, Archie, I thought, did a lot with, like, he had... 
um, some of my favorite and least favorite lines in this film because I think they, they give him, him up for some things. Yeah, they they give him a lot of the really like sassy audience voicing things stuff, and I don't know. I think it does doesn't always do him favors, but I think he does well with it to uh, further the comparisons to the talented Mr. Ripley. He's kind of the the Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, uh, role in this one, uh, but he's mm-hmm. he's also very compelling. Uh, for me, yeah. I, I I thought the person who also really stood out was Carrie Mulligan. It's kind of a small part, uh, almost mm-hmm. a cameo. But she, she said she got of, it last minute. She called her up. She goes, "Give me anything." She's yeah. like, "I got this. Let's go." She just has this like pathetic desperation that that comes through in all of her line readings that I found quite pretty hilarious. Yeah, because she plays a character who's like the friend who they have over, but she could leave whenever she wants. Yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> and yeah, she's, she's kind very of eccentric. the the Barry Keegan. Uh, to Rosamund to Pike. them, yeah. yeah. And then that's where you realize that these people almost always play with them, which is what the movie really play wants things, to yeah. build up to, yeah. Uh, and then there's also the sister who, Emerald Fennel, when she was young, I guess. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's all these interesting elements. I just sort of felt like it, it entertained me for a bit, and then I just sort of grew tired with it. I think it hints at this this direction that it's going and it plays sort of coy with something that the movie treats as a twist, but is not a twist at all. If you're paying any attention to like the context of the film. And I think just sort of like the, I think as interesting and as like kind of perverse as elements of the first and second act are, it's really a movie that falls apart in the third act. So I don't know if you want to jump to spoilers, if we want to just at least briefly uh, address whether or not you think this movie should or will be in the Oscars conversation. Um, Because Promising Young Woman was nominated for five Oscars, including picture, actress, director, Emerald hmm. Fennell won for best original screenplay. Yeah. uh, Production design? Sure. Sure. I wouldn't give it much else, to to be honest. Like, I like, again, the supporting we were mentioning with Rosamund, but, I mean, that's like better. 15, <laughs> yeah, not exactly. Top 10, not top five. So, yeah, uh, it's do you have it anything a, else? No, it's an it's weird because it's coming out at the end of the year and it's being treated as this prestige thing. But I kind of feel like this would have yeah, been, she won. I think this would, have, yeah, and for, I guess for a reason, but I feel like this was would have been better as like a summer release, just kind of like a, a you know, guilty pleasure July movie. And I think it would have gotten more attention and kind of been more fitting that way. It's being judged as an Oscar contender coming off a tally ride, so mm-hmm. I think that's the worst thing coming to it. But look, uh, we're more disappointed and confused by it, like the message she was trying to go for. Again, we were never bored, so I do see this in the span of her career. Someone right. who began with an Oscar has this. She is not going to stop making movies, bro. <laughs> she's going to continue doing crazy weird things, and I hope she's able to lock in a mode where the the reaction, the try-hard reactions that she really wanted from this movie... Uh, from the bathwater, I would argue one dealing with dirt, and mm. then I would argue one dealing well, at well, night as well. I'll ask you about um, those, yeah. That that all of those scenes uh, feel like and ready in out for the gift, like in out for the meme for the moment that you know Absolutely. it's going to begin. Where I feel eventually she'll be able to get those moments, but not feel like I'm here, audience. Let's see how much you can uh, put yourself through. I think in the future, she's going to be able to like find herself weaving those moments in and she'll be able to perfect it a lot more. So people may look back at Saltburn and be like, man, this one was underrated. They didn't understand it. Um, but that'll be for like way later, I think, in her career. As of now, I think Promising is a lot better than this one. I, I, I can see why that one had the track record that it did. Um, and I think that success is what's holding back a lot of people from enjoying this one. But as we broke down... It's also kind of the sophomore outing that yeah. that uh, I, I think had a lot of swings and uh, some misses and some stuck in the dirt. Yeah. But look, <laughs> I think it's a vampire story. L- let me get into that and then we'll get into spoilers. Uh, I think just metaphorically speaking, you have the story of this guy who comes in to mm-hmm. suck the life out of other people, right? I think all of that imagery is there. And sometimes the blood. Sometimes the blood just straight up, right? <laughs> um, but there are moments. We're in full spoilers. Everyone's here. 
Well, okay, just a quick reminder before we dive into the spoilers that if you are enjoying the review on YouTube, uh, like the video, leave us a comment, maybe consider subscribing to the channel. And if you're listening, you can subscribe on Apple, Spotify, whatever you use for podcatchers. So leave us a five star and you can support our show as little as $1 a month on patreon.com slash intercut pod to help ensure we keep doing reviews, deep dives, movie brackets, film festival coverage, and our best movies of the year list. So shout out to our awesome patrons for their support on that. And that is a spoiler warning for all of y'all. Uh, let's get more into Saltburn. They're having dinner. Jacob Elordi is in the dinner table with them, and yet he passes in the background. Wait, what, what do you mean there? There is a scene when they're having dinner, and Jacob Elordi yeah. is wearing a pink shirt. And they have the windows open that they'll eventually close out, where you could see into the hedges. And Jacob mm. Elordi clearly walks in the background. As a ghost? Oh, it can either be the worst mistake you did in a movie yeah. that's so meticulously made, but that's the one reason that I'm looking back at this, and I'm curious on a rewatch. How right. many little ghosts, how much of this is a Hill House type setting where uh, you have a guy who's not just there to take over the family, but you have a house that's full of ghosts. There's a yeah. lot of little production designs where they leave little Easter eggs there that she's also hinted at as well. So when mm -hmm. I noticed that, I started wondering, is it a mistake? According to her interviews, no, she's hidden a lot in there. So again, I hope that it's not, the deeper that I get into this and, and uh, on further coverage, that it's like the themes in the movie. She gets really close, but pulls back. Because mm -hmm. the moment I noticed that in the movie, I started thinking, yo, this is going to be really crazy. Because Alina and I saw it immediately. I don't think anybody else in the theater noticed it. And I'm like, that was him in the background. She's like, you saw him too? Yes. I thought this was going to be some like Dracula, Bram Stro Stroker's Dracula. Where Something he more really haunted. Is this, yeah, this, he really is maybe this immortal being. But then they go visit his parents. And in visiting his parents, it kind of reeled it back a bit. So again, it's like she wants this immortal being story. But then he actually has very mortal uh, things. Just like she wants to uh, comment on a lot of different things, but then doesn't really have the, the levity to do so. When you get to the ending, I was really confused because the house was never really the thing he wanted. Yeah, it, it's weird because it was the there's... People. There's all this like setup and I found a lot of the setup to be pretty compelling in terms of how Barry Keegan's character is trying to wriggle his way and, and you know, be deceptive in terms of it, uh, how he is, you know, developing this friendship with Felix. I thought all that stuff is interesting, especially when they decide to get to a reveal later on and how, you know, uh, that part is being manipulated. But then we actually get the to solve The dumbest reveal. Yeah. The, the du yeah, exactly. I think... Once ESPN you get past a certain point, once ridiculous. you get past a certain point, it's so like obvious the strings that are being pulled and to sort of pretend that like this, this new person who is trying to like become more like these people around him are, is suddenly they're all dying off. Like we're, we, any person who's seen movies before is going to put two and two together. And I think it's like, yeah. frankly, like condescending to buried. treat it like it's reveal. So that's why at a certain point I was just like, okay, you're just, how did the Brits say? You take a laugh. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, like, I don't know. I, I think the stuff that, I think the movie really gets bogged down at Saltburn. And part of that is that whole idea that you're alluding to. They're like, oh, people get lost at Saltburn. She has the maze and everything. The You know, we see Carrie Mulligan's character. And as soon as she leaves Saltburn and leaves the movie, we find out she's dead, right? Like, this is a, a yeah. place that, like, takes the life out of people. Uh, mm -hmm. But, like... I don't know if it feels like coherent in like what they're saying about that. Like, is it just the trappings? Is it the, uh, the lifestyle? Is it the, the atmosphere and the people like you're talking about? Like, yeah. it's just sort of like she throws all these sort of half ideas out and none of them feels focused to me. Mm -hmm. There were some reviews that didn't give a spoiler warning coming out of Telluride that obviously, you know, talked about Barry being the Barry character that we see him in a lot of movies from mm -hmm. killing of a sacred year. Uh, dear to, uh, I mean, he's literally the Joker, right? <laughs> in a big DC movie. So, Banshees. Uh, knowing, Banshees too, but knowing that he was going to come in with that type of very uh, psychotic type of demeanor, they kind of insinuated that he was out there for revenge. This mm -hmm. idea, like in the beginning, where everybody has uh, parents who went to the school. So, Archie's able to use the idea of the tutor, the dean, whoever it is that they're getting help from, knowing his mom. But then going, oh, I'll tell her you're his friend. And then that yeah. kind of puts that guy in a chokehold for the rest of the movie because he's like, oh, don't, don't, we know each other like that. They're able to use who they knew or who, who they're related to uh, as almost currency in this world. 
So I thought something had happened to his parents that maybe they were responsible for. Maybe Rosamond was responsible for it. And I started wondering if there was anything to pull from there. That might have made it feel more full circle. He just wanted the house? Yeah. And it's not not even like, he wasn't even like poor. He was just- He got rid of the maids. Not as rich. (laughs) That didn't even, yeah, he was just, yeah, he was way upper middle class if we're talking about yeah. that too with, when they get the reveal of going back in. Um, but it is kind of hinted when he goes to visit the the, the, the parents that the mom, the kind of a pushover kind of allows him to be that. And the mm-hmm. dad's almost like fed up with this idea of like, no, he does this all the time. What have you done now? And just, just goes with it, allows him to create these, these crazy fantasies. Mm-hmm. But again, like you're saying, does it end up just being this uh, accusation towards people like him and not this family that obviously is already scummy. And she's like, I'm not going to deny that. But like, y'all, have y'all checked over there? They're kind of ridiculous too. And that's such a weird, like, I don't know, the weirdest way to make a movie defending your family growing up by going like, they're weirdos over there as well. Cause (laughs) you don't really embody uh, what he was going for there. Cause I think he was really, if if it's a story metaphorically about him being a vampire who's sucking the life out of these people, then what's he going to do now that he's living alone? Mm-hmm. He enjoyed being with them. Dancing around naked in the house? For what? Yeah, exactly. To, to what? To what end? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what's which next? moment got the strongest reaction from your crowd? Uh, was it the bathwater? Was it the, the period blood? Was it fucking the dirt? She trained the audience. So the first one got all the uhs. Mm-hmm. The period blood had a guy yell out, Yes! <laughs> but the guy who yelled out yes was a sicko because yeah. when they're going around the house and it's that beautiful long take with Lordy going and this is this room and this is that room and that's where he did something with his cousin they also really like that line so I'm not taking I'm not taking what they what, what that guy was uh, reacting to not endorsing to with, uh, his, his uh, uh, statement yeah but by the end uh, they, they were wooing I saw it at the Music Box Theater Chicago uh, International Screening for the Film Festival I, they were just laughing at the uh, the dirt scene does it mean anything you know you got a lot of reactions and walking out they're like uh okay <laughs> It's just a lot of uh, okays for the moment. It's like, again, I, I feel for the memes, for, for the letterbox reviews that, that want to say, oh, I've never been more jealous of a piece of dirt, right? Like it literally sets itself yeah. up. It's it's a moment made for the for stand those accounts. types of stuff. Yeah. You know, you always say, you always mention Tumblr. She's a Tumblr girl. Yeah. This is a it, Tumblr It feels movie. like it, right? I was I was yeah. resisting the urge to bring it up again, but yeah. <laughs> I'm it surprised. Feels like, yeah, that's your go-to. She I is. Know, she has said it. She said she grew up with that. I mean, look, it's it's set firmly in the the heyday of Tumblr, right? So why not make it fe- uh, feel prime for that kind of uh, assessment and and that kind of like fawning look at like these fucked up but pretty a- actor boys. That's why she put it at that aspect ratio because it's perfect. To, <laughs> it's perfect <laughs> for the memes. Yeah, I uh. mean, I I don't know. It just it feels the first couple. It's like okay, you're sort of indulging, it, and then by the end, it, it's. It just feels, uh, I think that, uh, the, I think it was probably the period blood moment got the most like visceral reaction from the crowd. There is like a, an audible reaction of that one. And by the time you get to the, the graveyard scene, it's, you know what the movie's up to and it it kind of sits there for a while. And yeah, I mean like, you know, he's, it's his, his like love and adoration manifesting in a way where he wants to be the only one who can. Uh, have access to it. I don't know. It, it's just sort of. I get that. Didn't really land. She, she's good. Right. It, she, it didn't land, but I get what she was going for. And yeah. I'm not yeah. like, I'm just, I'm not disappointed by it. I'm just like, this is really all you had going for the movie is this, these type of like really awkward scenes to get a reaction yes. from people. Yes. I think eventually she will be able to fine tune that to a point that there'll be more discussions than just the, oh my gosh, he put his penis in the dirt. I'll tell you the one that actually did get the most. The dance? When they, huh? Uh, not the dancing around the house. Dancing around the house was pointless, but I kind of like the song. <laughs> yeah, it was shot. It, decently it was good well. prosthetic work. Was it prosthetics? That's they spent what the whole I've read. Talking about it, really? Yeah, yeah. We'll call it. We'll call it Barry. We'll let, we'll see what he has to say. Dude, it's the scene where he's on the computer and it turns around in the cafe to reveal he's writing nothing. That actually <laughs> got people to laugh the most. And to me, I went, dude, get out of here. 
of, of all the, most, the reveals, that might have been the dumbest. It was the most ridiculous reveal. It's so Why? stupid. It almost Why? feels like it goes all the way around, and she has to be having a laugh, bro. Yeah. She has to be making the, fun of it. At it's a, a campy point. moment for sure. And that's that's where I actually thought, wow, this could be a really good campy movie. But I think you and I are really big that if you're promoting your movie saying it's camp, that is uncamp. <laughs> so you sound like you might be might be stock up on Emerald Fennel. You, you, you feel like her next movie will be better than this one? I am not removing it. I'm not withdrawing, but yeah. I am definitely not depositing anymore yeah. at the moment. I, I'm, yeah, keeping you, study, I'm keeping an eye on the charts. You're, fu- you're fine with your investment. <sighs> yeah, because I don't think it's going to go away. If this is like this is her, at, her worst... Right. No, come on. It's still, it's still going to invoke discussion, right? When we do our brackets, we, we speak at it as producers. I, I think it's definitely going to have leverage. Like you said, it's like an A24 movie that's going to be on Prime. That's yeah. good for them. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I don't know, man. I like. I think there's still talent there. And like I did laugh with the movie several times. So I'm not like Sounds out like Emerald on Fennel. Emerald Fennell. I'd, I'd really hope she'd challenge herself to not... Like indulge too much in, in much in like the twisted nature of some of her movies, right? Like I kind of want her to, to to strip some of that away and tell like a good story first and foremost before you know focusing on oh these are like the dark moments that people will be talking about because I, yeah. I don't know if the movie a movie of moments is necessarily like what we need. I think something a little bit more uh, cohesive from start to finish would would help for the future. Very true. All right, so I think we both think that Saltburn is, like, not the worst way that you could spend a couple hours, but also not particularly successful either. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, look, visually, and if you're a big fan of Elordi, and if you want to be a part of the talk, especially Barry's got a lot of fans out there, I would say see it in a theater because of the the visuals of it. Story-wise, I think it's worth catching at home. Like, get it at a discount, watch it with with a, a group of people because it's definitely a reaction movie that she wants. But... If you can, get an Academy screener and watch it with your family. <laughs> yeah, pr- particularly before it's out, like months ahead of its home video release. That's the way to enjoy it, right? There you go. Uh, so that's all for this edition of an Intercut Review. Catch more from me, Zach Shevich, by following me on Twitter, Instagram, Learn Letterboxd, at Zshevich, Z-S-H-E-V-I-C-H. And check out my YouTube or TikTok channels, at Multiplex Show. Arturo, where can people find more from you? You can find me over at LME Movies on all social medias, Letterbox, all that good stuff. Over on YouTube here at Let Me Explain, where we've been making a lot of breakdowns. Or just every week here, covering the newest movies on the Intercut Podcast. You can listen to every episode of the Intercut Podcast on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, whatever your favorite podcatcher is. I usually use Overcast. And then make sure you subscribe, not just to the audio podcast, but to the video feed as well, where you can catch our busy faces as we break down the latest in entertainment. Find new episodes of the Intercut Week and must watch streaming on our YouTube channel every Monday and please leave us a comment like the videos consider heading over to iTunes to give us that much requested five star review and uh you can also check out our social media at Intercut Pod, our Patreon at Intercut Pod as well, our Discord, which you can find a link to in the description below. Uh, that's where we update y'all throughout the week. Arts updates, my updates, all the guests that we feature here on Intercut. Thanks again for tuning in. And until next time, people get lost in Saltburn. <laughs>